Um, but as we are the history, when I uh, proposed this uh, talk uh, in the spring, I also proposed it for the ACCU conference, and I actually uh, presented it there. And uh, then I presented it in Karlsruhe at the parallel conference, and I thought, well, it's easy, just to present it again. Well, uh, for some reason, uh, the C++ committee changed their mind. And uh, at the June meeting in Switzerland in Rapperswil, they decided to throw the old executors out. And uh, well, they haven't yet decided uh, on, the, on which new executors to put in. So um, it's a little bit difficult for me because I cannot present you what will be in, the, in one of the next standards because uh, we haven't yet up made, uh, made up our mind. And um, I will still present um, part of the original proposal because that gives the background and then I will present some specifics of the new proposals. So a short introduction. Uh, one of the motivations for uh, executors are the async uh, catastrophe because um, well, if you write something like that, um, so who thinks the output will be hello world? Um, the point is the output will be hello world. And that, ex and that is exactly the disaster with the async because you don't get any concurrency out of these two statements. And the reason of that is uh, you get a future as return, but you uh, decide to ignore that future because you are not really interested in the result of uh, stood out. So what happens is that the destructor will be called at this semicolon here. And at that point, the destructor will block for the thread that was started by async. So the output will be hello world. But this is not what normal people would expect. And, uh, but there's a very good reason why the rules are this way. So for now, the uh, point here is just, just don't ignore the return value. Uh, capture it in the local uh, variable and uh, then at the end of the block, uh, it will be structured, and uh, then everything uh, will be synchronized. Um, but the, the point is, to get out of that, we actually need something where we can run those tasks on. And the solution will be the executors, but yeah, we are not there yet. Another motivation is, uh, while we would like to introduce uh, higher level abstractions like uh, pipelines and things like that. So you just uh, start with this of a, from a completely different uh, example. We have a restaurant uh, where we have a number of orders. We have a number of chefs uh, who prepare uh, the dishes and we have a number of waiters who serve those dishes and uh, well, Actually, we have uh, three chefs and uh, four waiters, and they all go uh, through some kind of pipeline in this case. Of course, you can implement that differently uh, with some queue inside or whatever, but a pipeline is a nice solution for that problem. And uh, the, the, the main point is uh, where do we actually run all those tasks on? And, well, the answer here is we have some thread pool. Well, the point is we don't have the thread pool yet. A thread pool would be one example of an executor. So, yeah, that is another uh, motivation to have executors. And um, executors themselves are more or less considered as really low-level building blocks, at least by me. Not all, sorry. No, not all people at the committee share that uh, opinion, but I really think executors should be like allocators. Normal programmers don't really care about executors, and normal programmers don't really care about allocators. But we have then higher level abstractions like async or like uh, .then or this pipeline or whatever, 
and those will use those executors. And, uh, but this uh, calls for executors that are really done right. We had actually a problem with allocators that uh, the allocator turned out uh, to be not as useful as a lot of people wanted them for a number of reasons and we had to fix that and we only fixed that partially and we don't want to, to have the same with the executors, so we want to get them right. So we have now a problem. It's pretty urgent because we want to solve the async problem and uh, also we want to get it right and uh, yeah. We just haven't uh, made up our mind what is right. So just the history, uh, the first executor proposals were presented in a special meeting of the uh, concurrency study group in Bellevue uh, more than two years ago. And um, there was a paper presented uh, by Google people and another by Microsoft people. And we talked about that and thought, well, it's pretty interesting uh, and we want to go more or less into that direction. And uh, then they came back with a joint proposal and uh, we discussed that, um, I think, uh, in Bristol probably. And uh, so some people said we, we, we don't want a singleton there for some kind of default or a system uh, executor, so that were, was removed. And uh, so in the May version of uh, this presentation, at that time the current version didn't have a synchronization on the destructor and it wasn't clear whether that was uh, intended or not. And we didn't have a default executor because of that singleton, but uh, at that time that was accepted into the concurrency TS uh, that happened in Chicago uh, last October, I think. And um, yeah, uh, the proposal was called executors and schedulers, but we removed the scheduler part, so it's uh, essentially uh, really only the executors. And uh, there actually were some, or actually are some implementations of that proposal. And uh, well, these are the new proposals. I will talk about them later. And the original executor interface was really very simple. Uh, it was an abstract base class. So uh, everything was virtual and we just had an add that were used to add a new task to that executor and we had some kind of uh, query function where we could ask for how many uh, tasks are there that, are, that aren't started yet and that's it. But uh, really the interface was just the add. And uh, then, as I said, at some uh, point in time, there was a default executor, which was some kind of singleton. And uh, personally, I believe it makes a lot of sense, but uh, some people just don't like singletons. So uh, it's still up whether we will get them or not. And um, the point was made for that proposal that we really want to have an abstract base class. Uh, the, real reason is essentially it can cross binary interfaces. So you can actually provide binary libraries and uh, give those function an executor or use the executors of those libraries. And uh, well, the proposal said, well, works submitted to an executor, maybe executed in one or more separate threads, and uh, all closures are defined to execute on some threads, but which thread is largely unspecified. As such, accessing a thread local variable is defined behavior, so it's unspecified which threads thread local will be accessed. That was deliberately fuzzy. So the point is we are just talking about an interface, not about a concrete implementation. 
And uh, so we said, well, it will probably be some kind of threat, and so the threat locals are fine, but uh, more or less nothing else is fine. So for example, could a closure that is run on an executor move from one thread to another using work stealing implementation or whatever. Um, yeah, that was uh, deliberately left open. And we don't have any mechanism to cancel any tasks. Well, that is an old discussion, a very old discussion, and uh, we, we still cannot uh, converge to any cancellation of threats so or things like that. And uh, the add function, uh, that just was uh, defined, well, it's a virtual function, so we actually have to give the concrete uh, parameter type, and that is just a function that returns no, uh, that returns nothing and takes no arguments. And the point was, well, you can always uh, use, uh, for, for example, a uh, lambda mechanism or whatever to produce this kind of type. And another uh, deliberate decision was no future. So if you want a future back, uh, you have to put something around your task. You have to package your task into something that gives you a future so that you can uh, wait for a result. But that's not part of the executor, that's part of the packaging. So for example, part of the async interface. And it was uh, defined that add never blocks on any other closure. So if other closures are currently running, the add function itself will return. That doesn't mean that the task but it will be queued and uh, the add function actually will return. And um, There is absolutely no interface, no callback or whatsoever for starting something when a task is actually added. And for some schedulers uh, or for some executors, you actually might want to have such a behavior, that, but that is really uh, not intended in this kind of proposal. And if you throw an exception from uh, your closure, you are doomed. It will just call terminate, and that is fine again. Uh, again, you can package your task into something like package task or something like that. And uh, well, it turned out not really. You couldn't use a package task because that is not copyable. But uh, this interface actually requires that it's copyable, but that's a different story. Um, so, but you could package it into something like package task and uh, that will care about any exceptions. And uh, now, well, the, the, the real point about executors is it's an interface only. And then we will have some concrete executors and those will give you progress guarantees. The executor as an interface will give you no progress guarantee. And there are different kind of progress guarantees. Uh, there is weekly parallel, so there is no guaranteed concurrency. It might be that everything is uh, sequential and you cannot use uh, any synchronization between those tasks using classic blocking like Neotexas. Um, there's also the parallel guarantee. Um, that is still not guaranteed to be always concurrent, only after a task is actually started. So actually, after your task has started, it's guaranteed to run concurrently. So after your tasks are started, you are allowed to uh, synchronize you using uh, blocking mutexes, for example. The idea about that is, for example, a bounded thread pool. So 
if your thread pool is uh, currently full, there are no uh, free threads available, uh, your task is blocked, so it doesn't run concurrently to those other tasks. But once it has started, it will run concurrently. And then you have the full concurrent guarantee uh, that will guarantee you, okay, it will more or less start immediately uh, concurrently. So this is essentially what the current uh, launch a async does. And uh, then the destruct, uh, well, it was never really clear um, what the destruct gives you on synchronization guarantees. Because uh, the real reason for the async behavior that I showed before is that uh, if you have some tasks running on and uh, then you leave that environment, uh, then it might access uh, some objects that are not valid anymore. And to avoid that, you really want to have something that you can wait on, and those executors are something you can wait on, but the question is, does the destructor actually wait on all the tasks to finish or not? And uh, it turned out in the original proposal there were a number of uh, executors and some of those destructors actually waited, and other didn't. And then there was the count function, and uh, we don't have that in any current proposal right now, so I will skip over that. The scheduled executor that uh, had another virtual function called add add, but uh, this was deliberately voted out in one of the uh, successor proposal is, and uh, so we will not have that one. A uh, thread pool that is a concrete executor, which is a thread pool, as the name says. Um, it was defined as a bounded thread pool. So it only has a parallel guarantee, it doesn't have the concurrent guarantee. And uh, you had to give the number of threads uh, at creation time of that thread pool. There was no default constructor, so nothing like the implementation will figure out what number of threads is fine. So you actually had to specify what number of threads you wanted. And uh, for the thread pool, the destructure actually waits for all closures to complete. It wasn't completely clear in the wording of that proposal whether that also meant uh, that it waits for closures that weren't started at the uh, time the destructor was called. So that was a little bit open, but it was guaranteed that no task will run, will still run after the destructor returns. So that was some kind of synchronization. And the original thread pool was strictly bounded, and uh, so it was only parallel, no, not concurrent. Then the serial executor, uh, that is as its name says, uh, that will execute all the tasks serially, one after the other. No concurrency. Interestingly enough, it still provides uh, the parallel guarantee. Because there are never two tasks started at the same time. So, whenever your task is started, it runs concurrent to any other task that is started at that time, but as there is no other task started at that time, there is no problem with that. So you actually get the parallel guarantee for a serial executor. So this is sometimes a little bit surprising. Uh, even people at the uh, concurrency study group uh, were pretty surprised that uh, concurrent means, okay, it will be always parallel, but uh, parallel means it may be serial. <coughs> but there are reasons for that. And then the loop executor, well, the serial executor, that actually 
takes an underlying executor. So it will take a sweat or whatever from the underlying executor and it will run the task on that executor. It will run them serially, but more or less concurrently to your own thread that adds tasks to that serial executor. And this is not true for the loop executor. For the loop executor, that means, well, it's actually your thread that is running all the tasks. So you keep adding uh, tasks to the executor and none of them will be started. Only after you actually start the loop function, then all the tasks will be started one after the other. Either until all tasks are run and completed, or until one of the tasks will call make loop exit. This is a kind of uh, get me out of here immediately. So after that, no other task is started. And the inline executor, that was more or less just a function call wrapped into an executor interface. That was actually dropped because in this case, the add function would actually call that function and that is against the guarantees of the add function. So the inline executor is not part of any proposal anymore. And the thread executor that is like, like the old launch async, so that will start a new thread for each task. And with those executors, we could actually have uh, either a new launch executor policy, and that would uh, run them on a predefined executor, and uh, that would be that default executor. And uh, we could then wait on that default executor for all tasks to finish. Uh, that was discussed, it was, was never officially proposed. And, uh, but this one was actually officially proposed, so just give an additional executor argument to the async and uh, then it will run on that executor. And uh, a number of uh, possible ways to use those executors. One is the async that we just saw, then the dot send proposal that is a continuation proposal for futures. So you can say after this future is ready, I want to run this continuation. And this is exactly what the then does. And uh, you can actually give an executor to the dot then function. And it will run on that one. Then Chris Koloff uh, had a proposal uh, for a general framework for asynchronous operations and uh, that also had a number of uh, functions that uh, took executors as arguments. Uh, here the async receive, uh, here the original function uh, or the original task is run on this executor and it also has some kind of uh, continuation, the handle receive. And so you could actually say, okay, that continuation should be called on a different executor. <coughs> and then even for parallel algorithms, uh, well, they are mainly targeted at uh, something like vector hardware and something like that, but you can also run them on executors. This was actually part of the original uh, uh, parallelism TS, but uh, then we couldn't get the executors ready, so it was thrown out for the moment. And then just generic uh, task managers like the pipeline I showed or TBB had a flow graph facility where you could uh, really put together how your data uh, 
flows uh, through your tasks. And uh, well, all those tasks must run on something like an executor. And this is exactly what executors are for. Um, well, of course, given those proposals, I went off and tried to implement my own executors. And I do quite a lot of embedded uh, systems. So one of the things uh, I wanted to do was a uh, real-time uh, executor that just uh, give me a specific priority on my operating system. And well, it turned out to be not really that difficult to do that. I just had to give uh, the priority at the, or the, at the constructing time of the executor. <coughs> the downside of that is if I want to do my pipeline that I showed before, all the tasks inside of the, uh, t uh, of the pipeline run on the same executor. So in this case, they run all on the same priority. And this wasn't really what I wanted to do. But in the original proposal, there was no mechanism that I could do otherwise. And also, I, I could have uh, my a uh, scheduler that uh, has a number of tasks, and each task defines, okay, I want to be restarted after that and that time. Again, I have the same problem. It is all fine uh, if, this is, uh, if the time is global to the scheduler, but if I want to have only one scheduler, but all with different times, I have a problem. So, and the problem is, um, well, the original proposal always said, well, just add another add function to your specific executor. But this doesn't work if my executor is actually a low-level thing, and I give that executor to something else that doesn't know my extra add function. So I want to handle that uh, somehow differently, but uh, there was absolutely no way to identify a closure to the executor. Because that, this would have been sufficient because then, then I could uh, have my own global function or out of band function or whatever to say, okay, this closure has this priority and uh, this closure wants to rerun every five seconds or something like that. But there was no mechanism to do that. And again, this comes from executors being some low-level building block. So here's an example how I actually want to do that. Um, I have my data concentrator, which is just uh, an, an embedded device, and it reads from two different inputs, and it writes to one output. And the point is that one of those uh, inputs is very time critical. It cannot hold uh, the data for a very long time. So one of those uh, input uh, functions has a much higher priority than the others. And uh, this is exactly what I wanted to do and what I couldn't do with the original proposal. Fortunately, then came the new proposals. And, um, well, there were actually, uh, the first uh, new proposal came from Chris, uh, Chris Kohlhoff, and it came out of his, um, more or less, his ASIO uh, library. So he's the author of the Boost ASIO library, and this was more or less uh, proposed uh, uh, for the networking group uh, for C++ to more or less standardize something like ACO. And Chris said, well, that is all fine, but uh, the asynchronous operations, well, they also take some executors, but the executors that you currently have uh, simply don't work. And uh, so he actually, well, originally he just uh, proposed his universal model for asynchronous operations and said, well, future is not the only thing to wait on, but you want to have others. And um, then 
he actually said, okay, the executors uh, don't work, so here's a new executor proposal. And uh, yeah, as you see, that was after I pre presented uh, this the first time. This was uh, in May this year. And then in June, we had uh, the meeting at uh, Rapperswil in Switzerland, and uh, well, then actually all the network pay, uh, people came in and said, uh, well, we really want that. And the, the point is, Chris Koloff never came to the meetings, uh, but in Rapperswil, Dietmar Kühl actually presented his proposal, well, at least partly, and while they were, first they were pretty pervasive, uh, and uh, the second thing is um, they actually had enough people in the room. So we actually removed the old executors from the concurrent CTS, uh, which was well, actually a pretty good consensus. So uh, this means uh, strongly in favor, in favor, neutral, against and strongly against, and there was nobody strongly against, uh, but quite a lot of were in favor of that. Uh, but we more or less said, well, there still needs to be some work to be done, so more work on that. Uh, that was complete consensus. But when it came to the question, well, should we add that more or less right now? Uh, well, we know that we need uh, some changes, but should we already add it to the uh, technical specification for concurrency? Then it turned out, well, the room was more or less split. Those were the networking people and those were the concurrency people. And uh, so, um, yeah, there was no real consensus to really adopt those executors. Well, and then uh, another quiz, this time Chris Meissen uh, came and uh, actually wrote a successor of the original Google and Microsoft paper and modified quite a lot of things there and uh, said, well, given this, you can still implement your asynchronous operations uh, uh, with pretty good performance, and uh, this was presented in, the, in a Redmond meeting uh, this September, which was a concurrency-only meeting. And, um, well, there were only the concurrency people. And uh, so, actually, uh, they decided, okay, we want to start with this paper for the executors in the concurrency TS. And uh, yeah, there was pretty strong consensus on this. Uh, interestingly, both strongly against were only present on the phone. One was from Brit uh, Britain and one was me from Switzerland. And we said, no, we actually like the other one much more. But um, rather the point was, uh, even if they saw, okay, at that time they had consensus, it was clear that uh, we, we still had those other votes. So it's clear we don't really have uh, consensus yet. And uh, last month in Urbana Champagne, uh, we had a lot of discussion there, but still no consensus. So, um, I will just present uh, both proposals here and show the differences and uh, we will see what will be in some future standards. Well, probably not C++17 because it's probably already too late for that. Um, so this is Chris Kornoff's uh, proposal. So he has a class executor. And one of the things he has, he has not a single add function, he has actually three functions. He has a dispatch function, a post function, and a defer function. And a lot of people simply don't know when to use what, and uh, I don't know either. Um, but the good point is I actually implemented one executor and uh, those functions are defined that you can just implement the post function and uh, the other two functions just forward to that function. So it's fine, it's okay to do it that way. And uh, you, you can actually, well, they, they have slightly different uh, semantics in terms, okay, how eager should the executor try to run that task? 
and uh, the executor then can actually optimize on that. And that is actually pretty useful in all those uh, async I.O. operations where you have a lot of continuations and you actually want to run those continu continuation as soon as the pre uh, previous function has finished uh, on the same thread. And you really want that, and uh, then you use uh, dispatch, I think, and uh, then everything is fine. And, um, well, those, this is the member functions, and there are were, there were also global functions, also dispatch, post, and defer, uh, which take an executor and a completion token. And the completion token is more or less just what is the task that is just bundled into a completion token. And that completion token uh, tells the executor whether to return a future or run a callback uh, on the uh, ready uh, or whatever. And so one of the big differences to the previous proposal was that there are actually three functions instead of only one to start a new task. And another big difference is uh, it actually uh, separated out those heavyweight things that actually run all the tasks and keep all the uh, threads and something that is lightweight and just uh, gives enough in information to tell the actual execution context uh, on which thread and when to uh, start that and so on. So more or less the executor is some kind of policy and the execution context, uh, well, that is actually the mechanism that runs all those things. And uh, he proposed a number of concrete uh, executors. Uh, what he called system executor was more or less a thread executor what he called strand was a serial executor, and then the thread pool and the loop executor, more or less like the previous proposal. And this proposal also had a mechanism uh, to wrap a task with an executor. and to ask a task for its executor. And this turned out to be actually pretty useful because this way I actually could implement my real-time executor. And I will come to that. Mm, yeah, I will come to that right now, but uh, we'll go through it uh, very quickly. Sorry about the flicker. I have no idea what's the reason for that. Um, but what I wanted to show you is uh, here my uh, concentrator. As I said before, I have two inputs. I have uh, one output. The input data is just for K of data that, that I read in and I concentrate that uh, to more or less just uh, three. Something is very strange here. Um, to just uh, three 30 bit values, uh, 32 bit values. And um, I also have an invalid value. And then I have my read device class um, that I, and then I give that a number just for identification and a file descriptor because that is on POSIX system uh, the me mechanism to uh, talk to the outside world. And um, there I have the function uh, call operator that is, uh, that I will show just in a moment. 
Um, no, I skipped that, unfortunately. So the function call operator here Um, so this while loop is uh, just to ensure that I really uh, read exactly my 4K, and uh, then out of those uh, 4K, I take uh, the, the actual data out and uh, create a short data, and if something went wrong, I just uh, provide an invalid, um, I print an error message typically to some log file, and then I return an invalid object. And then I have uh, the output function more or less, and in this case I just uh, write it to some stream, and uh, well, in my implementation, it's not movable, so I just have a reference to that stream. And here also I have my function call operator, and that, that just uh, writes the data to the stream. That is simple. And in my uh, main function, uh, you, you can ignore all those types here. The real thing is uh, I open my two inputs, and... Um, Then I actually create two different executors, one with priority 80 and one with priority zero. And uh, then I just start my concentrator as I showed before. I just uh, give them the one task for the one device with uh, priority 80 and the other two with uh, priority zero and uh, run that. And, um, The real-time executor, well, that is just an executor, how it is uh, implemented in uh, that model, and I need uh, something to store all my threads, because in my executor I just start a new system threads and uh, give it the right priority. So I have uh, my class uh, thread back, which is just a vector in my case of, back, uh, of, of threads. And, um, and the point is here, I actually use a given execution context um, and have, in addition, my priority information. And here you can see that I actually... Um, implement the dispatch in terms of post, and uh, the same for defer down there, and here I actually only uh, implement the post function, and what I do essentially is, um, well, I use the service out of my context uh, from up, and, uh, and then I start a new system thread, here an operating, uh, here a normal thread, and I use the native handle to go to the operating system handle and uh, set the priority, and then I add that thread to my bag. And that's it, and you can see here that I also um, implement the defer function in terms of post, and... Uh, yeah, here are some details of the implementation, but, but I think that is not uh, really important how that is implemented here. What is more interesting is actually the implementation of the concentrator. And that... Oh. So that is much better now. Um, so what I have here is my concentrator. It has uh, it's a uh, it's a template uh, over the data type, uh, 
my inputs and my output. And I have a constructor here that uh, takes all those, including the size of the queue in between. And the really interesting thing is here, well, you saw on the main function, here I used web to wrap my actual read function together with my real-time executor. And now I use that. I asked my task that I got posted for the executor, and then I post on that executor my uh, my function, in this case it's a, it's a wrapper around the consumer, I need to wrap that to call that function and then, uh, well, in, in the, for the consume wrap uh, to call that function, it takes out something uh, out of the queue and then gives it to that function and uh, for the produce wrapper it's just the other way around, uh, the, my read function gives me a value and the wrapper put that into a queue. So that's it. And here in this case, I also package that into some kind of package task, so I can actually wait for that. So this is my kind of, uh, this is my synchronization. But the main point here is I can actually ask my task for the executor and then run the task on that specific executor. So I don't have one executor for my whole uh, concentrator, but I, but I actually have three different executors. But remember, in this proposal, an executor is really only a very lightweight uh, wrapper around the real execution context. I only have one execution context here. So that was uh, the implementation uh, of my real-time executors based on Chris Koloff's uh, proposal, and now we come to Chris Meissen's proposal. And uh, he again goes back to the original interface and only has one function, which is now called spawn. So we have now three different uh, proposals. One is add, one is spawn, and one is uh, post-dispatch-defer. And uh, yeah, I cannot tell you what we will eventually get. And um, he proposed more or less uh, the executors uh, that uh, were in the proposals before because he actually referred to that original proposal and just called it revision number four. And uh, he removed the scheduled part, so it's still called executors and schedulers, but it doesn't have any schedulers anymore. Um, and he proposes uh, that threat per task executor, threat pool executor, zero executor, loop executor, and the system executor, which is the default executor. So it's a global object, essentially. Well, it's a type, uh, it's a singleton type, uh, but yeah. <clears throat> and then Outside of that class, he actually also has an executor reference, which is, again, a lightweight on top of an executor. He doesn't have that uh, separation completely right now, but we more or less told him, okay, if he actually goes on with that proposal, he has just to separate uh, those completely. And an executor reference also has the same interface as an executor, so the function spawn. And uh, yeah, we will also notice that this is not a virtual function, and it's actually a template on the uh, function type. Um, we, we still believe that the uh, Virtual uh, interface will be important, but uh, we can add that on top on any proposal afterwards. And the interesting thing about the executor ref is that that can be used uh, using the task wrapper, 
and the task wrapper is actually something like the wrap of the other proposal. So you also have a get executor and uh, you, you have the external function set executor. So you can do essentially what I did with the wrap and get executor. The only problem with that proposal is that it also provides a function call operator so that you can use this task like any other task. And uh, they thought, uh, well, that is a very clever idea and I think it's very clever, clever and very dangerous. Because what you can do is uh, you can produce a pretty nice deadlock. And the problem is, here again is an example of a pipeline, and you run that pipeline on a serial executor. And you know that you run it on a serial executor, but you have some synchronization between stage one and stage two, so you explicitly call uh, run that stage two on a different, on a concurrent executor. However, if that uses that function call operator, which is just a trick around, so it actually gets the executor and runs it on that one, then of course this must first be started. This must first be scheduled. The point is that will never be scheduled because uh, the serial executor is currently busy with the stage one and the stage one will never end because the stage one waits for stage two. So we had a vote in Urbana and then at that time I saw that the first time and I just said, well, this will probably cause deadlock, but I couldn't come up with a good example. So at that time I was uh, outvoted by actually a pretty vast majority, but uh, I think I will just come back to them and uh, tell them they should rethink their decision. <coughs> okay, so that is a state right now. So executors are an important building block and I believe they should be really low level and we don't know yet how the final interface will look like and uh, well, we, we don't have real experience with existing executors because all executors uh, that we had before have their flaws and we did decide not to standardize them. But uh, that also means that we don't have uh, real experience. Uh, for, for example, nobody noticed that with the original uh, executor proposal, you couldn't do something like the real-time uh, example. And uh, so we really need to look carefully and to try a lot of different things uh, before we actually decide to standardize something. So the dilemma is, on the one side, it's pretty urgent. And uh, Hans Böhm, who is uh, chair of the concurrency subgroup, as, as well, he's very reluctant to vote out a concurrency TS that doesn't have a solution for the async uh, problem. But on the <coughs> other side, I think we sh really should get it right. And um, right now we don't know what right means. Questions? When you talk about the async disaster, is that specifically the problem of people calling async and not bothering to grab the future that comes back from it so that it runs serially? When you talk about the async disaster, are you specifically talking about the example you gave at the beginning where people call async and don't grab the future so it runs serially? No, the, 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 the real problem is if you have a generic interface and you get a future, you have no idea where the future came from. If it came from an async, the destructor will block. If it didn't come from an async, it doesn't block. So that is a real problem.
Um, you, you talked about the three, four progress guarantees that, um, that we've defined. Um, does the use of Chris Kolov's uh, three uh, dispatch post and defer functions, does which one of those you choose to use or the combination you use affect what pro forward progress guarantee you get? Sorry, can you? So the um, yeah. question is, is the forward progress guarantee I get from my executor under Chris Kolov's proposal involving the three different dispatch post and defer functions, do I get a different guarantee depending on which one of them um, I use? No, no, no. Uh, the progress guarantee is really on the concrete executor. And, uh, well, if you have a serial executor, uh, it doesn't help that you have uh, three different functions uh, to start a task. You still only get uh, the guarantee of the serial executor. And if you run it on some vector units, for example, you also get only the weekly parallel uh, guarantee. It doesn't matter how, uh, what function you actually use to start that task. Okay, so just in time, thank you.